this speaker breaks the laws of physics. But before we can appreciate how special this thing really is, first, we have to learn a little bit more about how speakers actually work. Ever wonder why some speakers are bassy and others aren't? I know it's a weird question, but stick with me. When we think about things in nature that make a lot of bass, we think about large things with mass, like a volcano or an avalanche or a whale. Is the same true with speakers? Well, this iLoud micro monitor and this Bayo Sound Bang & Olufsen Explore, it's not the same size, about the same weight, but totally different bass responses. So why are some speakers bassy? Let's look at this. The Yamaha HS5, a classic studio monitor. This is what we call a two-way speaker, meaning that this one speaker is actually two speakers. Up here we have what's called a tweeter, which handles the high frequencies, and down here a woofer, which handles everything else. But for sub-bass, and I mean real low frequencies, we're gonna need something like this. This is a subwoofer. And this is what you see in places where you need bass to really like fill a room. I'm talking movie theaters, I'm talking concert venues, even like some crazy home theater setups. This is Genelec's 10 inch subwoofer. And while size isn't really like the whole story, having a big cabinet like this will definitely help you get a lot of bass. But if size isn't the whole story, what does make a speaker bassy? Well, in the 1960s, engineers were beginning to ask this question themselves, specifically engineers at a company called KLH. Now eventually, KLH co-founder Joseph Anton Hoffman came up with this little thing that we now call Hoffman's Iron Law. It's not exactly a law of physics, it's much more of like a loose description of some of the physical properties of air, but it can be really helpful in explaining why some speakers are bassy and others aren't. Here's the gist of it. A speaker can be small, a speaker can be loud, and a speaker can be bassy, but it can't be all three. You have to pick two. So it can be small and bassy, but use a ton of power, like the DVLA Phantom, or it can be small and efficient, but not get very much bass, like an Echo Dot. It just can't be all three. And that's sort of the nail in the coffin for Bluetooth speakers, right? I mean, Bluetooth speakers, they need to be small so that they're portable. They need to be efficient so that they can get loud without wasting their battery life. And they need to be bassy because that's what makes them fun to listen to. So what do we do? Well, if we actually go and read Hoffman's Iron Law, we'll realize it's not as simple as it sounds. In order for it to be true, your speaker enclosure must have an airtight seal. Which makes sense, right? Sound is air, and if air is leaking from your speaker, it could be making sounds you don't actually want. So what would it be like if our speaker had a hole in it? No, what if our, <laughs> what if our speaker wasn't airtight? Yeah. Remember this guy from the beginning of the video? There's a hole right in the back. Yamaha did not make this an airtight speaker. Why would they do that? Well, when a speaker cabinet is sealed, the cone has to fight against all that air pressure inside the speaker cabinet. If you cut a hole in the box, now the speaker cone can move much more freely, meaning it can get way louder with way less power. Let me show you. See, a speaker with a hole in it is just a vessel with one opening, like this glass bottle. And uh, what happens when we move air in and out of this vessel? Well, it resonates. And what happens if we do the same thing, but with a bigger bottle? Well, the frequency gets lower. And the same thing happens with a speaker with a hole in it. The bigger the speaker cabinet, the lower that resonant frequency is going to be. In the 50s, we didn't know what to do with this resonant frequency. But now we know that we can very precisely tune the shape of the speaker and the shape of the hole to get a nice low resonant frequency that actually gives us a bass boost with some costs. See, in order to actually get this bass boost, we still need a reasonably large speaker cabinet to make sure that the leaky frequencies are nice and low. That's why that Genelec sub from earlier was so massive. 
There are some tricks you can do to get around this, like passive radiators. JBL uses that in a bunch of their Bluetooth speakers. But even that stuff won't give you the same rich, full bass you'll get on like an actually large speaker cabinet. While cabinet size isn't the whole story for why some speakers make a lot of bass, Hoffman's Law tells us that cabinet size is most of the story. And for that reason, tiny little Bluetooth speakers are only going to be able to make so much real bass. Or at least that was the case. This is Brain X by Brain Audio. And this is the bassiest Bluetooth speaker I have ever heard. Brain claims all over the internet that this speaker breaks Hoffman's Iron Law, which I was skeptical of at first, but then I actually used it. And even with a sealed subwoofer inside, this thing gets loud, has excellent battery life, and makes sick bass. So how'd they do it? Well, they did it with a clever mechanism called a magnetic negative spring. We all know how a normal spring works. It has this resting place original position, and the more you stretch it away from that original position, the more force is created wanting to snap it right back. A negative spring actually has the opposite properties. It also has a resting position, and the more you pull it away from that resting position, the more force there is making the spring wanting to explode out further away from the resting position. And that force is actually the perfect force to counteract all that air pressure we mentioned earlier in the video. Remember how that air pressure is always gonna be pushing back on the speaker cone, wanting to force it back into the speaker cabinet? Well, now we have a magnetic force counteracting all of it. Now, it's not quite that simple. Brain uses permanent magnets in their magnetic spring, and permanent magnets are not very smart because they're literally rocks. So to throw a little intelligence into the equation, Brain also uses a series of electromagnets to keep everything lined up. These electromagnets, they're not actually moving any air, they're just keeping everything in the correct position for the actual speaker driver and that negative spring. But even if it is a technological marvel, what's it like to actually own? I've been using this Brain X at home for a few weeks now, and I absolutely love it for listening to music and especially watching movies in the wired mode. The bass totally rocks and is pretty much the smallest, most complete home theater setup you can have, and the mid-range is surprisingly distortion-free. If you're in the market for a Bluetooth speaker or you want to replace an old cheap soundbar you have in your house and the $599 price tag meets your budget, I would definitely take a good hard look at the Brain X. Now, just because this speaker breaks Hoffman's law doesn't mean it's a magic speaker that will solve all of your audio problems. It doesn't have like the crystal clear imaging and high end that you would find on a studio monitor or even the DVLA Phantom back there, which is, you know, twice the price. It also has some latency that all Bluetooth speakers have. So if you're using it in a home theater setup, you're definitely gonna wanna use it in the wired mode. But that's not what this video is about. I got so excited about this thing because it's proof that now is an amazing time to be an audiophile. And I'm not talking about the old school $2,000 preamp kind of audiophile. I'm talking about a new kind that has a really deep appreciation for all of the clever innovation that companies are bringing to the table right now. There's head audio studio monitors that can seal and unseal their cabinets. There's PMC mastering stacks that cost six figures and look like they're owned by the Terminator. There's the speakers on the MacBook Pro that use some of the crazy craziest signal processing ever, and it totally deserves its own video. There's those wireless studio monitors by III. Are you sure it's called III? I know you've talked to them about I don't know, actually. No, I'm not sure. <laughs> Yo, Ellis, Dave. How do you pronounce I, is it III or is it IAEA? <laughs> It's III. There's those wireless studio monitors by III that get 16 milliseconds of latency streaming 44116. Like, how does that work? It's uncompressed. And when a company puts forward something this new and cool, 
a technology that they say can be scaled down to an earbud and up to a concert level speaker. Come on, you gotta make a video about it. It's, it's so new. 10 years ago, a speaker this size just couldn't make this much bass. So I hope this video inspires you to go and read the manual of your speaker and learn all about the cool things that it's doing under the hood. I hope this video inspires all the cool speaker manufacturers out there to be more transparent about how their stuff actually works. Looking at you, Apple. And I hope this video worked in spreading the word about some really cool tech. But in the meantime, I'm Ellis. This is the studio. Thank you for watching. Like and subscribe. And uh, go go watch Dune 2. It's like it's like the best movie ever.